This Ethiopian-born vocalist has made her mark on the billboards, received a Grammy nomination in 2009, and has been in the studio working on her latest record, The Expats. Don't miss the show at the drama Saturday. Hi guys, I'm Tade Arage with Tade Ass Magazines. I'm about to go and meet up with Wayna. If you're in New York City, or even if you're in DC, I would definitely go check her out at the drum. She's gonna be there performing this coming Saturday. All right, follow me. So this coming Saturday on July 27, I'm playing at the Drum in New York City and um, really I'm so excited about the show because it's going to be uh, the debut of some of the new songs that I've been working on. I just, you know, really have missed performing and cannot wait to share this new music that I've been working so hard on and I, I know the band is going to be great, the lineup is going to be great and I hope that everyone will come out because it's going to be a special night. Okay, this is a good time to ask you about the zone. Sure. Um, you think you're going to get in a zone? I have to get in a zone. I have to when get you, in a when zone. When you're on the drone, are, are we going to see zone? Zone is coming in the drone. <laughs> I, have to, I have to do it because, first of all, I'm driving all the way up to New York. I mean, I know I'm not going to go through that, um, that trek and, and not experience that feeling. That is the... That is the feeling that can last for days after, and it's uh, something that every performer looks for, forward to. It's just a moment when you forget yourself, you forget what you're doing, you forget what you're trying to do. You just lose yourself and you feel free. You just feel free in that moment. And if, and if you're really letting go, everyone else feels free too. You can feel it in the audience, in the band, the sound guy, everybody. So I, I miss that, and I'm really looking forward to um, giving in and letting whatever comes out come out. All right. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> For real. When you, you get a chance to to um, evolve as an artist. All these things are happening. And, and then it's wonderful when you can like combine. You know, it's always as, I mean, I was born and raised here in America, right? Mm -hmm. But I've also been very rooted in my parentage and my culture. Mm -hmm. So trying to balance these two value systems can be quite a task. Mm -hmm. And doing it in your own life and then again doing it in your music. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me about that. How does that work? I think it's a constant process. It's a constant evolution. I mean, I think for me, like, you know, I started as an artist thinking that I wanted to make the kind of music that I was listening to and that I loved, which is very different from where I am now because I, I realized over the past eight years that I've been doing this that I wanted my music to not just be music that I loved. I wanted it to represent me and to be something that only I could do. What is it that me as an artist is different from my peers and that I need to incorporate in my music? So that, trying to make something that's innovative and that reflects my cultural experience and my my emotional experience growing up in the U.S. and being from Ethiopia and having all of the influences that I had, that story is unique and that sound is unique. So it was an evolution for me to just really decide that this time around I wanted to do something different and honest. It, it meant so much to me um, as a new artist and even more so now to have the Ethiopian community behind me. It, it really made all the difference to me and it made a difference to the people who were doing business with me too. And, even, and it was part of the reason too why I wanted to make an album that had more of an international sound to it because I felt like I, I owed it to um, this very important part of my support base right. to, to make something that reflected them. How, how has the music, um, you know, like the music model, how has it changed? Like how do you get your music out there and how do you reach the community? Yeah, I mean I think uh, for me live performances are always the best way to reach people because you have an immediate connection with the listener and you can just really relax and let something sort of spontaneous happen and magical happen. And it's it's the most persuasive means that I have as an artist to win over a new listener. Um, but obviously, you know, it's 
expensive to tour and play a lot of places and it's costly and um, you know, consuming in time too. So the internet is the best way to really reach people and have them hear your stuff and with the, the social networking being what it is, you know, it's a great opportunity for, for me to, um, you know, have music that isn't on the radio or that isn't, um, you know, in like a major chain, a major retail chain, be heard. You are in your studio and you're just thinking about how you want to, you know, get inspired and, and pick some some new music to work with and, and you're going to just do what you normally do when you're in here. Oh, I see a karar back there. Um, yeah. So I got this karar when I was in Ethiopia uh, last. Um, and it's basically, you know, always been my dream to learn how to play. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of lessons and I, you know, I just, re looking at the style of music that I'm doing and the way my band is made up, mm -hmm. um, I decided to go, decided to study Masinko instead, but I still have it because it's one of the things that eventually I'll, I'll get to, but it's here. But this is, it's, it's really cool because it's modernized so you can amplify it. Um, and uh, so, yeah. This How is, is it down different from like you know a regular acoustic guitar, like in terms of? Well, the difficulty in it is that um, it is tuned the way that the karar players they retune it um, to whatever song they're singing. So if you've ever noticed when an Ethiopian band is playing, there's like a long lull in between the songs, and the songs are really long usually. Mm -hmm. Part of that, I think, is because they have to tune the instrument to whatever song they're playing. So it's a little difficult for, for my show to play it throughout because every song is in a different key. I could show you, this is one of my... Imitating him and then trying to sing with him, so... So what exactly, what will you expect from this? I'll imitate him and then I'll try to do my own thing. So I'm listening exactly... You know you gotta find a way to bring some love in here today. And I'll pretend like, okay, I'm singing in his band. So what would I do? Like, we don't need to. See how um, how much emotion he has in that one note? We don't need to. So I try to like imitate it and then. To me, brutality, yeah. What's going on? I wanna know what's going on. See, this is, I mean, this is how singers like learn licks, right? Definitely trying to balance music and family is a challenge. It's part of the reason why it took me some time to really uh, put together the album that I wanted. That and the fact that I was more ambitious in my production goals from it in terms of it being mostly with a live band and being involved in the production from the ground up. Um, but it's one of those things that it's a double-edged sword because it's harder but at the same time there's a, an inspiration there that makes you work harder and strive for more you know I think for me having a daughter it really just um, made everything 3d you know really because I felt like now was I not only trying to be a great woman and artist for myself I felt like I had to be a, a great the best example that I could be for her and the time that I was going to spend away from her uh, investing in my work had to be worth it. it. It couldn't be something that I was just good at. I had to be great at it and it had to be something that she would uh, be inspired by. So that's why I really wanted to work hard and make it special, really super special. Tell me how, like, how, when you when you hear these different sounds, um, and you're putting your music together in terms of different instruments, how? Tell me about that process. How does that work? And like, because I heard another song had a karat in it, and so like I, I'm, you know, kind of like on this on this uh, roller coaster of different sounds when I'm Wonderful. listening to the music. So Great. tell me how you incorporate all these things and why you choose one uh, instrument over, over another, another for that particular sure. you know what I mean? sure. The song sort of evolved in different ways. Uh, for, um, you know, some, some songs just sort of 
have a, um, an emptiness that you feel like, okay, this, this particular sound or this particular artist would add something special to it. I know for long as you know, you know, it was inspired by, um, shucks, what is the name of that song? Um, In Your Eyes. Um, and I really wanted um, this sort of uh, combination of African and alternative rock. So the, um, the, the music was this sort of police kind of vibe, um, a Sade meets the police kind of vibe, but I wanted to add an African element to it. And I had always been a huge fan of Sadeng, who's this incredible singer and masinko player in the area. So I really jumped at the chance to have him on the record because I knew he would add a whole nother layer of um, just excitement and culture and depth to it. And it was really inspiring to see how he could like, even though it was a completely like traditional like rock ballad, how he could fuse it with you know an Ethiopian melody and, and really connect with the song. So, and Tomas Govana was uh, kind enough to produce his section on it, and it was really amazing in the studio. I mean, really, like, he blew away everybody that was in the studio. Uh, he was this kind of unassuming guy, and he comes in there with his instrument and just, like, kills it. So, it was really amazing. <laughs> so, the album is called The Expats. And it is called that because of the diverse group of musicians and producers who worked on the project. Initially, when I started the album, I started in the same vein as my previous albums, where I got beats from various producers and I would write to them, a, hip, a traditional hip-hop soul um, model. But with this project, I wanted to build it from the ground up. I wanted it to have an African influence. I wanted it to be international sounding. So um, I, my business partner who's based in Toronto, Idis Mbiala, encouraged me to come out there and just jam with some musicians there and see what happened. And we got together in a room, guys from all over the world, Japan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, Kenya. There's a, a guy who's from India, Uganda, Jamaica, I mean, from all over. And we just got in a room and just jammed. And we would try out different grooves, and if something felt right, I would ask them to play it enough, and I'd get a few bars and bring it home and write to it. And over the course of a year, that's what we did. I would go up to Toronto, uh, we would come up, come up with these grooves, and then I would bring them home and write to them. And then eventually we went back and started recording the actual songs. And we recorded more and more, and um, a sound started to emerge. And we found that even though we were from all over the world, we had very similar musical tastes. We all loved um, The Police, we loved Radiohead, we loved Ray Charles, we loved Lauryn Hill, we loved Bob Marley. And we found a way to incorporate all of our different strengths and styles into these collection of songs that really represented not only our musical taste but our cultural backgrounds. So because everyone was from all over the world, um, I decided to call it The Expats. Oh, you, I know.